Um, what I would like to talk about today is, is something we were working on for quite some time. To a certain degree, that's also a hammer looking for a nail. It's a magnetometer that can operate in the regime of, um, well, in, in finite fields as a, a scalar magnetometer while also getting some vector information. Um, and at the same time, you can use the same hardware package um, as a quite sensitive zero field magnetometer, vector magnetometer. And um, what we use that for is if we want to characterize our shields for precision measurements or big magnetic shields um, and then inside we install a mapping robot and that's basically an arm that can go up and down, it can rotate and then the sensor can move radially so we can explore the, the whole volume inside here um, where we are interested in the magnetic field and we want to make it as homogeneous as possible. And so our goal is to, to find dipoles or other stuff hidden in this, in this volume. Um, and we typically do that in an offset magnetic field, our experiments, but uh, the dipoles might not be related to the offset field. And so it's great to have a magnetometer that can operate with the field on, and then you can switch the field off and see, okay, what remains? Is this the same picture? Um, is it related to the coil or the shield or something else? Okay, so uh, this is how it looks. Uh, not very beautiful, I think, but, but it works. Um, and so, yeah, in finite fields, it's a scalar magnetometer. In zero field, it's a vector magnetometer. Um, and, well, that's basically the outline of the talk. Um, so let's start with finite fields. And uh, this already has been presented many times uh, here. Um, we uh, also work in a pulsed regime in order not to have any feedback problems and, and phase shifts that could compromise our uh, accuracy and stability. Um, so what we do is we record uh, free spin precession signals, um, fit the frequency, and then we get um, scalar magnetic field measurements. And uh, the way this particular magnetometer works is that we have a pump beam, actually several, um, that produce vertical magnetization, so along the magnetic field. And well, this, this is a relatively slow pump, um, and it takes uh, one whole of those, those uh, cycles to create a sizable um, magnetic uh, polarization along, uh, sample polarization along the magnetic field. Well, then, of course, we have to have a, a pi half pulse to flip that into the vertical plane, uh, to the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. And then it starts oscillating, of course. And uh, of course, we, we have spin decoherence, so this, this circle on which the, the spin goes around the magnetic field becomes smaller in time. And since the pump laser is on all the time during that uh, decay in the, in the transverse direction, we build up the longitudinal direction again. And that means we can start the process directly again after uh, we have recorded this, this uh, free spin precession signal, and then here we can have the next pi half pulse. Okay, so um, now I've, I've promised some vector information. How do we do that? Um, if you measure the spin projection along one laser beam here, of course you get the well known uh, free spin precession signal. If you measure it along a different axis simultaneously, you get uh, basically the same signal, just phase shifted. And then if you measure along a third axis, since this uh, spin is precessing in a plane that is well, almost uh, perpendicular to the z direction, there's only, it's only up here a little bit and down below the plane here a little bit, uh, you get, well, again, another signal that looks like that, just smaller. And now, uh, what I usually say in talks is we, we use the frequency to determine the magnitude of the magnetic field. We use the uh, relation of those amplitudes to determine the vector. Um, and that's how it works. Now, for this workshop, I mean, you are all specialists. And I'd like to show you a little bit more details how that actually works. And the first thing is the pumping. Um, if you, I mean, I told you we, we want a pump that is uh, constantly on, so we, we, we need this laser beam, um, and then we want to read out perpendicularly. And um, we opted to, to rotate that scheme by 45 degrees. That means that the laser beams 
go through the cell at the 45 degree angles with respect to B0. Um, that each beam has a, a vertical component. That means they both contribute to pumping. And each beam has a transverse component. Um, so they are also both acting as probe laser beams. And the nice thing about the, the uh, opposite direction of these two probe directions is that you can build the difference between the two and a lot of technical noise drops and you get a clean probe of the transverse um, magnetization in the X direction here. And then of course uh, you, can, you can put four laser beams, you, you do this, this 45 degree cross uh, in the X direction and in the Y direction and that's why the module looks like that. We have uh, optical modules down here that produce a, a laser beam and we have four of them and then the beam traverses this coated uh, cesium cell um, and is recorded by photodiodes sitting here. So we have four photodiodes um, and four beams. Okay, so the, the real signals that we get um, look a bit like that. Uh, still free induction decay signals, this, this small signal from the Z direction doesn't appear here. Um, and they have opposite phase, yeah, beam one and two are in one plane, so uh, they have opposite phase. Beam uh, three and four um, are in one plane, just 90, uh, 90 degree rotated. They have opposite phase, but phase shifted. And now what we do is we, we subtract those two signals to gain a probe along Mx. Um, we subtract those two signals to have a probe that probes the y direction of the samples magnetization and we add all four laser beams to get something that is proportional to MZ. Okay, now each of those signals uh, looks like that. And um, what we really need are, well, the uh, amplitude and, and the frequency and phase components that are hidden here behind. So of course you, you can do a, a fit, a direct nonlinear fitting uh, to gain um, well, the frequency, of course. Um, you can write it, of course, as, as a frequency plus a phase. But for, for the purpose of this talk, uh, and, and people that work with me, they know that I like phases. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, I'd like to uh, disassemble that into an amplitude that goes uh, for the sine wave and then quadrature amplitude for the cosine wave. So you can determine those with a fit or using demodulation. Um, Earlier in the conference, uh, there was also a method presented where you do a Fourier transform of, of this and then fit the Fourier transform. We also tried that, but um, the exact shape, the model that you have to fit to the Fourier transform depends on the uh, shape of your resonance or the shape of the, of the decay. And to get that really exactly right is difficult. And so, the method that I like to use um, does not need, does not have such a strong model dependence. So what we do is um, we, well, basically use a Locken amplifier or we demodulate this signal with a fixed reference frequency. So we take the input signal, we mix it, so multiply it with a sine cosine version of this reference frequency, then we low pass filter that. Um, and then there is uh, a nice block here that uh, takes the absolute value of the two and the arctangent and then we can gain the magnitude and the phase. And there's a beautiful algorithm that you can use in FPGAs called the Cortic that would do that for you um, without using multiplication. It's just bit shifts and, and adding and subtracting. Um, that's really fascinating that it's possible to do a relatively complicated um, computation absolutely efficiently in FPGA. Um, okay, so uh, let's, let's have a look at those signals. And so here I, I simulated something that looks a bit more like, like reality. So um, you have, of course, the decaying sine wave producing um, a peak here. And then uh, you have one over F noise and there's some 50 hertz noise hidden in here. Uh, this, this is a remainder of the 50 hertz noise. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff going on, and of course uh, we could add more disturbing peaks here. 
And now if you take that signal and you mix it with a reference oscillation, and I, I deliberately put the reference oscillation not at the same frequency but slightly offset, um, what happens is that the mixer produces all sum and difference frequencies. And so first of all, the, the peak, um, it's mixed down to the exact distance, uh, the exact uh, difference between the reference and our signal. Oh, that's this peak here. Um, and the end, we get the sum. This is this peak here. So at approximately twice the, the signal frequency. And then all this noise is mixed up to the reference frequency. And that's the brilliant thing about uh, um, well, heterodyne detection, that you can get rid of that. Um, so the, in, in time series, the signal looks like this nice beat here. And, but you still see, look, uh, here, you, I mean, there's the signal in your head, but here you see really that the noise, um, it's, it's, it sits in between here and becomes really large. So this is not really clean yet. But, of course, uh, doing a low-pass filter is easy. Um, so the filter I've selected looks like this. You can do that digitally. And then, of course, um, well, you suppress all this noise. You, you suppress all the 1 over f noise. That now is below the, the noise level. And then the signals look like that. They become really clean. Um, if you compute the magnitude, so just a squared sum of these two, um, you find the envelope of your uh, decay. Um, and that's already important information. And if you compute the phase, and here I uh, blown, have blown up the, the arrows a bit, um, and of course if it, if it wraps around, uh, usually the phase would make a 2 pi phase shift, but you can correct for that, and then you get uh, a phase that um, really develops just linearly in time. Um, and this is a measure of the difference between your reference frequency and the uh, frequency in your signal. That is very easily determined with a, a linear fit. Um, and so from this you can determine the frequency, from this you can determine the decay time, um, and from the starting phase and that amplitude you can determine those two amplitudes. Okay, so that's the way we like to do that. Um, there's one drawback, that in order to apply such a steep filter here, um, the filter in the time domain has to have a certain width. And, um, I mean, filtering works like that, that you take this, this red filter kernel and you multiply it with your signal and then you move it uh, a bit and uh, convolute your time series with this filter kernel. And that means that the highest signal here at, 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 at small times, um, they get multiplied with zero. So there you lose a bit of the most precious part of your signal. Um, and unfortunately, that's unavoidable. Okay, uh, let's come back to, to this situation. Now, of course, we, we do the parameter estimation with all the signals. Um, and uh, so again, uh, the, the MX, MI, and Z, we, we gain those from the four laser beams. Um, and then we do the parameter estimation. And now I've, I've chosen here time equals zero, and at time equals zero, the sign is zero. So all the amplitudes that we see in this picture must be the cosine amplitudes. And so, well, we can see there is, there is a cosine amplitude in x, no amplitude in y, um, and in this example, there's a small amplitude in z. Um, now, if we go to a time where the, like a quarter of a Lamar precession later, um, then all the cosines are zero and the sines are one. Um, and so the vector that we see here must be cons um, put together with the, the sine amplitudes. And in this example, it's just a y component that has a non-zero amplitude. And um, the trick now is these, these two vectors are guaranteed to, to process in a plane that is perpendicular to the magnetic field. The two vectors are also perpendicular to each other. And if we build the cross product of those, we gain something that is parallel to B0. So that's how we do it. Um, it's, the, it's also the, the statistically most efficient method if you can get two vectors that are um, at 90 degrees to gain, to gain that. And then, of course, the magnitude 
of the magnetic field um, is, is given by the frequency of the signal. So how well does that work? Um, this is an, an LN deviation of a measurement we took in the neutron dynamic experiment at PSI. Um, and here you see the multi-theta well, and the phi angle that we extracted from the, the vector. Um, really interesting is just the theta angle um, because if you work close to the axis, the phi angle becomes really undefined. Um, but the theta angle here you see, um, if we use lock-in demodulation, uh, we get the blue curve. If we use the least square fit, we get the red curve. And um, the least square, square, uh, least square uh, fit is statistically more efficient because of this filter width. We don't throw away the first precious moments of our signal. Um, and for small integration times, that's better. But um, the least square fit um, suffers from, well, that we cannot model our signal completely accurately. And so we, we have small, small shifts. Um, and then if you average for a long time, those become relevant. Um, it's like one over F noise, um, because your, your estimated parameters, they, they wiggle a bit around in this nonlinear method. Um, whereas the demodulation technique is completely stable over a few thousand seconds, uh, and we, we get very nice angular resolution of uh, 10 milliradians, uh, to 10 microradians, sorry, um, for up to one to 3,000 seconds integration time. And well, that's the information we are looking for, because um, if you do such a mapping of the magnetic field, that, that takes an hour to, to visit all the points in your shield. And so you, you want something that is stable enough to compare a point to another one that was taken a thousand seconds later. Um, there's a problem with, with this whole system, and that's accuracy, again. Um, if you have a hair under your baseline of a magnetometer, that's already an error of about one millirad. And we, we can resolve 100 times better. Um, it also means that we can find things, for example, um, a magnetized part that would tilt our magnetic field a little bit. Um, but it's difficult yet to, to say, well, OK, we've measured a magnetic field direction to such an accuracy. OK, in uh, magnitude, this magnetometer, well, in this conference, I must say, fairly sensitive, 80 femtotesla per root hertz, and then uh, also fairly stable. Uh, but this curve here is limited by the magnetic field we used at the time. OK. Um, now, operation in zero field. Let's switch gears completely. Um, and again, I mean, in zero field, we have no magnetic fields that disturb our spin. So, I mean, the starting condition is uh, that the magnetization is along Z because uh, we pump it that way. And then, if we apply a small magnetic field along X, of course, uh, this Handler resonance effect um, rotates the spin and there's a new steady state uh, with a certain Y component. And of course, that's uh, what we measure in order to infer the, the X component of the magnetic field. And then of course, if that gets stronger, we get more of this Y component. Now, if we, if we track the, the tip of this vector for many different values of BX, it makes a really nice circle. And preparing this talk, I realized this, this is an exact circle under ideal circumstances. So, I mean, uh, homogeneous uh, depolarization and, of course, steady state. Um, and it's a circle, uh, well, of course, centered uh, here at the middle um, and goes to zero here, of course. One such circle represents a scan of the X value of the magnetic field. And um, well, I mean, of course, that, that's already uh, a brilliant measure for the magnetic field, but um, in order to, again, get rid of the 1 over F noise, uh, you would like to modulate something. And the standard technique is to modulate the field direction that you want to measure. And then you can have two different relation frequencies to, to get vector information in two different directions. But here we did something different. Um, we modulated the Z magnetic field. 
And this is something that can only be shown in three dimensions because now for each of this uh, X magnetic field um, circles, so a scan in the X magnetic field, um, you can plot that for a different Z magnetic field. What basically happens is that the circle rotates. Yeah? So if the, if the steady state at, at zero mag, um, Z magnetic field <coughs> rotates to this angle um, in the presence of a Z magnetic field, it would go to this position. And now, if this Z magnetic field modulation, um, well, this, this is a sinusoidal modulation, then what happens is in this manifold, we go back and forth. Um, and so as a function of the X magnetic field, we see more or less of this modulation in the X direction of the, uh, of the magnetization. So our probe MX probes the X magnetic field in this configuration. If you demodulate at the uh, precession frequency, at the uh, modulation frequency. And the same thing works in exactly the same way for the Y direction. Um, just rotate the picture by 90 degrees. Um, if there is a component along the Y direction, then uh, you, you see this modulation in the Y magnetization measurement. Okay, so um, what we do is we, we modulate the Z magnetic field with a small coil. Um, again, we have the four laser beams. Um, as before, beam one minus beam two probes MX. Beam three minus beam four probes MY. Um, they both go through a lock-in amplifier referenced to about 10 hertz uh, modulation frequency and then we gain a signal proportional to BX and BY simultaneously, modulating at the same um, modulation frequency. Now this modulation frequency is quite small and the, the reason for that is um, that we use a coated cell. So this has a relatively long uh, spin coherence time and if we would modulate uh, faster, then this would wash out. Um, and for that reason, this magnetometer is not particularly fast. We have to have a low pass filter and the lock-in amplifiers um, to demodulate that frequency and this has necessarily to be a smaller frequency than that. Okay, so this is how the signals look like. They are nice and clean. Um, and in this case, it was a magnetic field uh, ramp. And you see that the coil was not perfectly aligned um, with the direction of the magnetometer. So we see a large signal in MX and a smaller signal in MY. Um, and it turns out that there are actually uh, Lorentzian resonances going through all the math. Uh, you find Lorentzian resonances here. Okay, so what's the performance of that magnetometer? This is a, a frequency spectrum. Um, so our measurement of the Y component and the X component, uh, you see here simultaneously taken. Um, and well, I, I said this is not a really a high bandwidth magnetometer. Um, we uh, have to suppress this. Uh, so this is a uh, noise component that is uh, imperfect filtering of the lock-in. So we suppress that afterwards with a digital filter. And so it's like three hertz uh, bandwidth or so. Um, so if you choose some, some region of interest here, you find uh, sensitivities down to something like 35 femtotesla per root hertz. Um, the nice thing is that this is basically flat until 0 0.1 hertz. So it's, it's a low frequency sensitive magnetometer. Um, if you plot that as an Allen deviation, um, you see that, that those statistical scalings here are, um, well, actually not, not really well visible. We have an, an minimum Allen deviation at the integration time of about a second. Um, and then it goes up um, to a few hundred picotesla for, for like a thousand seconds uh, integration time. So that's still fairly stable operation. Um, and that allows us to, to compare again measurements that were taken like a thousand seconds apart. Okay, um, let me summarize. Um, this device uh, in finite fields does uh, 3D vector measurements with a magnitude sensitivity on the order of 80 femtotesla per root hertz and um, like a, a stable below 300 femtotesla uh, um, Allen deviation up to a thousand seconds. Um, and we can do uh, angular resolution of about seven micro uh, for even longer integration times. And then we can switch with the same physics package 
um, just by, by changing the way we, we drive the coils around it uh, to zero field operation where we can do at least a two vector measurement, two D vector measurement um, with sensitivities uh, better than 55 femtotest approach hertz um, and, and uh, also stable operation uh, for long integration times. Okay, um, that was, uh, well, many people contributed to that work. In particular, well, I mean, the, the Newton EM correlation because they provide the whole um, environment to do this work. But in particular, it's uh, Sama Afach, you might know, um, and uh, Vira Bonda. So thank you uh, for your attention and thanks my collaborators. <laughs>